All right, Kyle, you ready to rock and roll? I'm ready to rock. Let's do it. All right, Kyle, so just quickly introduce yourself here so we know a little bit about you, who you are, what you do, what business you run, and then we can go from there. Sure, so I run a company called Proposify, which is a software as a service business. We basically make software that helps uh, large sales teams uh, with the workflow and automation behind their sales documents. So if they write a lot of proposals as a team to, to win new business, um, that's typically a very painful process for a lot of sales teams. We, we, we essentially make that a lot easier and, uh, and allow them to create more beautifully branded proposals uh, to their prospects. So that's what we do. So what was the, what, when you found out that that was what you wanted to build, what was that story like? How did you find out and what, tell us about how you initially had that idea. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I studied design in college. That's kind of my background, uh, kind of self-taught web design and development around the mid 2000s-ish, which reveals uh, kind of my age. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I got my start in agencies working as gra you know graphic designer, web designer, that was where I started to notice that a lot of these agencies, they always had to put out proposals to win new, new business. And as the designer, I had to lay them out and make them look really good. But then I had you know account managers bringing back changes and it was a really chaotic process. So I remember it was pretty, pretty soon after around when Basecamp came out and I was like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if there was like Basecamp for proposals? It was just that kind of idea I had one night in my basement kind of sketching it out, building a quick little prototype. Uh, and then I essentially sat on it for years, started an agency, kind of went on, out on my own, first as a freelancer before growing it. And you know, we still face that problem internally. We, we wanted to get into product development and build a SaaS company, me and my business partners. So over the course of many years, it was like we finally kind of got, in, got the idea out there and tried it out. And it turns out like a lot of people have that problem. Hmm. So Kyle, on this, on this show, I'd like to start with a random question just to get things kicked off on the right foot. So the random question I have for you is you wrote a book that I saw on your Twitter, you had on your header and you had tweeted about it mm -hmm. a little bit there. So tell us if we were to read this book, tell us what the title is and all that good stuff. Um, if we were to read this book, what, would, what should we expect and what, you know, tell us just the outline of this book and why you wrote it and all that good stuff. Yeah. I wanted to write a book for a long time and um, when I sort of was playing around with ideas what I what I realized was that a lot of times when I'm on interviews like this people want to know kind of about my backstory my personal kind of history combined with how I started Proposify um, because it's you know I guess it's a little bit of a uncommon way to start a business also I live in Halifax Nova Scotia which most people don't know where that is I'm not like in Silicon Valley or anything so they're kind of like, how did you build this kind of business in uh, Eastern Canada? Um, and then, you know, I've, I have, I've had kind of a, a, a unique upbringing in life, being raised in a highly controlled religion and cult. Um, and so, you know, I kind of wanted to write a story that was almost like a personal memoir combined with a business book. And so it's called uh, Free Trials and Tribulations, How to Build a Business While Getting Punched in the Mouth. Uh, and that uh, that launched just earlier this year in January 2019. There we go. I mean, I definitely saw it, and I said, "It looks like a book that I should pick up." And never, everyone else I read or listens to this this show because we're the young entrepreneurs that definitely have to get punched in the mouth to build something like you have. And so, I recommend that we go pick up that book. But Kyle, or how to to dive deeper into the startup phase of your company, Proposify. I know you talked about it a little bit before. Dive deeper into how you legitimately started um, scaling the process of, you know, you started freelancing and then where did you go from there to, to keep scaling your business and making sure that you got to the point you're at now? What did you do at that point? Mm. I kind of, you know, I, there's a, there's exceptions to every rule, of course, but I, I kind of feel like you have to like burn through a business and just do it really badly and, and make a huge mess. And before you kind of like learn the ropes of what you should be doing, um, you know, and, and I mean, maybe going to business school helps with that stuff. It lets you make those mistakes in a, in a safer, controlled environment. But I always kind of liken it to, uh, I don't know, like just reading a book on surfing, but never actually going out and you know, hitting the waves and, and feeling the pain, right? So, I mean, my first business, I think, I think was kind of a, uh, a failure. And it was about five years. Uh, I started it when I was around 24 years old. So I, was, I went freelance as a web designer and then I 
um, joined up with my business partner and we started hiring. And we, we never got huge. We got to like 12 people at our biggest. But um, there was a lot of things that were holding me back and, and just things that I just didn't know because I, I didn't grow up in an entrepreneurial environment. I hadn't run a business before. Um, so I made a ton of mistakes and, um, and it was kind of like through that learning process I was then able to build a company like Proposify where we were able to get bigger and be more successful and then now I'm making a whole bunch of new mistakes. <laughs> so it's, it's that never ending process. So Kyle, when you were in that startup phase, what kind of resources, if you're talking to a younger entrepreneur, like they, they're kind of confused on what resources that they can use and leverage in the, in the early phases, if they're gonna build something like a SaaS software that they can start scaling and selling, what resources did you use? And then having the knowledge and experience you do now, what do you recommend we use in the early phases if there's any softwares or you know, links, um, resources, you know, Events, like what do you recommend if someone were to start over and do something that you have done? Where do you recommend they go to learn about all that stuff so they can get to, to the spot you're at now? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of advice out there, and, and I think there's never a shortage of that. Whether it's books, going to conferences, talking, to, you know, taking mentors, and um, I think that some of the problem though is that a lot of people won't listen to advice. They have to experience the pain themselves. And I, I did this like even a year ago, right? I, uh, I had read, um, uh, not Predictable Revenue, but the one that came after that, Impossible to Inevitable. And it was about scaling up a sales team. And I remember somebody said like, you should read this, you're at this point in your, in your business. And I kind of like glossed through it and was like, yeah, it doesn't really apply to me. And then like I experienced the pain and all the failure from that. And then I reread it and I was like, oh shit, I really should have paid attention to that. So I think it, it, more important than, than um, you know, consuming books and listening to podcasts and doing all this kind of stuff is like actually, um, you know, pay attention to the things that people around you are telling you and, and give it a fair, give it a fair shake, even if you don't think it applies to you. Because I have entrepreneur friends who are, you know, starting out and I give them advice sometimes and I can see it. They're just sort of eyes glaze over and they're like, you don't know. <laughs> that happens a lot. And I'm, you know, I started pretty young too, 24 years old. So like, it, it is a little bit of youthful naivety to, to, to just sort of say like, well, that was your problem. I I'm not gonna have that. Um, I know that didn't really answer your question, but, uh, but I think it's worth noting. <laughs> Honestly, there's so much to be to be had with podcast books. People don't really realize that there's books on how to scale. Like there's so many of those, and I don't think that people really take it serious enough. And obviously, there's the mentor route. You can go towards people that have done it, and then if you need to talk to someone, you need to have someone telling that to your face. Then that's obviously a better route as well. Mm -hmm. But just however you learn best, I feel like is what you should press the hardest. But Kyle. When you had started Proposify, what was the very first thing? Is once you had the idea and you had the software built, what was the very first step that you took to start selling that? What was the first system that you had? And then eventually, how did you scale that or add to that? Tell us about that story in the beginning. Mm. So, I mean, you know, here's the thing that a lot of people when they're starting a SaaS product is they kind of think that, okay, I've got my idea. I've got a couple of people maybe I've talked to, and, and some people actually don't do that enough. They just build their idea without talking to enough people um, or getting kind of a prototype in front of them or going through customer discovery. But then they kind of think that, okay, it's built now, it's done, and now I'm just gonna go sell it and try to scale it. And it's, it's much more of a messy kind of iterative process. So you kind of have to you know, do the customer research first, the discovery, make sure you really understand the pain you're solving. And, and you know, side note, too many new startup founders in tech are, are get really excited about technology. They're like, oh, I want to build a Bitcoin startup. I want to build a AI startup. I want to build a VR startup. And they're so focused on the technology. They have they they then kind of build the tech and then go, now I got to figure out who to sell this to. It's like you have to reverse that, you know, and especially if you're a technical founder is like getting around like just understanding a market, understanding a customer really well and the pain they have, and then reverse engineering how you can solve that problem. That was, that's kind of a, you know, a side note. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we started Proposify. We, we knew that we were solving a big pain. We had talked to people. I, I would argue maybe didn't do enough customer research, but thankfully we got a little bit lucky and 
um, and it really was a true pain. But you know, it took like 17 months between when we launched and when we actually started hitting product market fit and scaling month over month. So there was a long grind of like, put something out in people's hands, they tell you it sucks, try to fix it, put it out again, have people tell you something else sucks, fix it, put it out again. Like, and in the meantime, make no money. Like that's kind of what that <laughs> process looked like. So you can't even re really begin to scale it until you're hitting product market fit, you're able to make some customers happy, you're starting to see growth every month. Um, then you can start looking at what are all the systems now you can put in place. What's your marketing engine looking like? What's your sales engine? What's your product team? And start hiring those people who are gonna lead those departments and scale the business and help you. So to Kyle, with that being said as well, what facets and systems do you recommend we do to get that market fit? What did you do and what do you recommend going through that uh, to a younger entrepreneur? So, you know, product market fit essentially is your, there's a there's a addressable market, so it's not everybody. It's it's a segment of the world who you you understand really well. It could be an industry; it doesn't have to be, but it could be um, a function within an organization. It could be, you know, something where you can actually target ads towards them, or um, you know, be, you can't be all things to all people. So you have to be pretty selective about who you're going after. So, for example, for us in the early days we were going after digital marketing agencies that were very small. And I remember investors and people you know, telling us like that's way too narrow a target, like you, way more people have this problem than you're really giving credit for. And we had learned because we had made the mistake with our agency of being all things to all people. Hey, we build awesome websites for everybody. We thought that was a really good thing. And it turns out like every, you know, especially over the course of like mid 2000s to late 2000s, it's so easy to get a website. There's Wix, there's Squarespace, and then bigger companies, you know, they're not gonna go to like a little web design agency in Halifax when they, when there's a million of those around them, right? So general, general being a generalist will kill you. So you have to go narrow and deep on a certain niche. And that focus on digital agencies for the first two years of our business was what really helped us build that first million in revenue. So Kyle, what um, do you recommend a younger entrepreneur do when they're first getting into just the tech markets? Is there anything particular that we should know when we're either trying to build SaaS or some kind of software or something along the lines of tech in general? What do you know that you can tell us to really begin knowing before we even jump into something like that? I think if you're if you're getting started in tech, and so this is the assumption is that you're not a programmer, you're not a computer science grad, some someone anyone like that, you know, you're already kind of there's an uphill battle there because you, you've got to understand a whole world that and, and also try to build a business, which even if you know tech is super hard. So um, I would recommend if you're coming at it as a non-technical co-founder, find a co-founder who is technical or find at least, you know, employee number one who has that entrepreneurial drive who wants to help you uh, build the business from scratch and isn't you know they're 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 not coming at it from like wanting this really stable secure job at a big company they're like no I want to help you build something um, because right away that's gonna help take care of that whole side that you don't understand but if you're the non-technical co-founder you have to bring something else to the table and typically what that looks like is some kind of industry expertise so if you're building a legal software startup to sell to legal, you should probably have been a lawyer or, or have sold to lawyers or know that market really well, um, combined with really good sales and marketing and maybe operational experience. Um, because ultimately, if you have a technical co-founder who can build the product, the rest is on you. You have to understand your customer. You have to understand what vision of what kind of product you want to build and then you also have to get out and market and sell it and probably also raise money and deal with finances. So there's a lot on you to learn. So Kyle, when, when you're in the early phases of your business, again going back to that, did you use any software scaling that while you were still building your software? What, what kind of things did you integrate to make the process easier with less friction? Um, what kind of infrastructure did you have in the early phases or was it just you and your co-founder kind of taking half and half of the groundwork? Um, tell us about how you had that system initially set up 
in the, in the early earliest of phases and then how you scaled that just a little bit as you grew. Yeah, so it started really with three of us. So it was myself, my co-founder, Kevin, and our CTO, Jonathan. Jonathan, you know, he he understood the code and he understood how to build what I was trying to build. I was kind of like the product guy who could design the screens and talk to customers and figure out what we needed. So we, he and I tag teamed on that. Um, also, I worked on the marketing side. So I would, you know, basically built our, our marketing website, did a lot, wrote a lot of blog posts and guest posts and just kind of got our name out there, did a bit of SEO work. Um, handled some paid advertising, like that kind of stuff. And then my co-founder um, really dealt with the operational side of the business. So he was out there raising money, trying to like keep money in the bank, um, you know, buying, th you know, basically everything else that wasn't what I was doing. So that's kind of how the split looked in the beginning. There really wasn't a lot of systems. I mean, we signed up for SaaS tools. We used a bug tracker. We used, uh, I don't know. We had a help, um, we use Groove for like our help desk, that kind of stuff. Um, but really it's like, as you begin to scale, you figure out where all that stuff breaks. You have to start taking some of those hats off and hiring people who are better than you and trusting them to kind of take the reins and, and do it with your um, guidance and oversight, but not, you know, I think like I made this mistake in my first business was I was trying to be the rock star all the time and I was trying to own everything and not empowering my team to do what they do best. And that's a really important lesson to learn. Yeah, that's so true. And as you scale, it gets harder for you to do all those things. And then you just have to, you have to understand what you're doing and then you can outsource that to someone that, you know, can just take that away. You focus on the creative scaling, being the CEO in particular, mm -hmm. a person that's creative and scaling the company. But Kyle, what was one of the obstacles in the early phases that you faced that was really challenging for you, and then how did you go about solving that um, to to get over it, or what did what did you do resourcefully to to get over that problem? Um, tell us about the obstacle that you remember, the the ugliest one in the earliest phases, and how you got over that. I mean, the ugliest thing was the transition to go full time into the business, mm -hmm. right? So. We were, we were running an agency and that was not doing well, that we were losing money on month over month. We were struggling to pay our staff, pay ourselves, keep the lights on. And at the same time, we were, we were working on this product that had zero traction and we were trying to juggle both things. So um, Kevin had been working on selling the agency and, and essentially offloading it to somebody else so that we could, we could do that. And at the same time, raising money for the startup so that we would have a uh, a bit of working capital to be able to go full-time in the business. Um, and he really took on the bulk of that stuff. Now, I was involved throughout the negotiations and the process, but but man, I mean, if you want ugliness, that was ugly. Like the buyer, we finally found some buyers for the agency um, who were just essentially trying to get it for free. And we were in such a desperate position, we, we, we did hand it over for free, you know? Um, and the, the transition, the process there, I mean, the stars aligned through uh, like a year's worth of work or 10 months worth of work. The stars aligned in about May of 2014, where we finally offloaded the agency and raised 270,000 for the startup, which gave us the capital we needed to be able to go full time. But the process to get there was probably the worst time of my life where I felt suicidal. Yeah, that's what you come, that what honestly sometimes comes from entrepreneurship and it's just kind of the fact of the matter it's really that hard it really is that hard at points there was one there was one occasion where so there's a bridge that goes um, from the city of Dartmouth to Halifax and there was an occasion where like my business account was overdrawn my personal account was overdrawn and I didn't have any change on me, so I couldn't get across the bridge, and I had to like wait for somebody else to go through and sneak by, and it was like that moment where I was like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> that's so true, and definitely it's, that's where resourcefulness comes into play. You know, you gotta really be creative with how you're making it through life and how you're scaling your business. Mm. So entrepreneurship is definitely the way to go if you want something that turns you into a high-level person. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Entrepreneurship is, is one of the best, um, uh, my business coach says this all the time, like it's like, not, not self-help, self, self yeah, yeah, personal development, right? It's, it's one of the best tools for that. It 
it really is. I do, I do believe it. And just for me being in my position doing this, um, I, I can definitely feel, I don't know, this isn't a full-blown business, but I definitely understand a little bit about what CEOs, founders go through just from running something like this. And so Kyle, to get into some of the logistical stuff really quickly, when you had to file your business legally, what did that process look like? Because I know that some younger entrepreneurs are confused about that process between markets like you know, if it's different between a food brand or, you know, in your case, a SaaS company, what was the process like when you had to go through filing your business legally? Did you simply just outsource that? Um, what did that process look like so you can dive deep and, and break it down for a younger entrepreneur? Hmm. I think this is a really good point to bring up that um, because I was thinking about this yesterday. We're going through kind of a, a difficult um process right now with our board and with our investors and our lawyer um, who I'll give a shout out to Robert McGinnis Cooper is an amazing business lawyer and he's been with us now for years um, we also have an amazing CFO at uh, BDO uh, named Kelly Johnstone and these two are really our our trusted advisors so in addition to having your internal team your leadership team in a business also having those like the legal and, and financial advisors that are that are there with you is is two of the most important partnerships that you'll ever make as a business owner. And when you're starting out, you don't necessarily need the top end, um, but recognize that as you start to grow, you're probably going to want to um, change who your your legal counsel is and who your financial you know CFO for hire or or you know the person who's helping you out on with projections and balance helping with balance sheet all that kind of stuff like. Those things get overlooked because they're not very sexy and they're not very exciting, uh, especially if you're somebody who loves product and marketing, kind of more you know creative stuff. But those partners are going to help you through so many difficult things in life. So things like registering a business actually pretty simple, at least in Canada. It's like you hire any lawyer and they you know um, build you a corp you know corporation and get you your your minute books and all that kind of stuff. It's not that craziness. You registry a joint stocks probably a little different in the United States, but um, you know, that's like starting a business, but then as you're growing, that's where things get way more involved, especially if you're ever looking at raising money or getting acquired, like you need all that shit together. So when you're talking about that CFO handling some of your finances when you're scaling, is that, is that an internal hire? I, I missed that. Was that someone that you have within your own business or was it someone like a consultant? That you have. We have a consultant. Um, a lot of businesses, I mean, sometimes they'll have a co-founder who's very strong in those areas and that's that's fine. But if you don't have it, I think a consultant uh, is fine, especially where they're, they're probably really expensive. So you don't need them there full time, 40 hours a week, but you do need them when it comes to if you ever have a board and you raise money, you're going to need a lot of, um, you know, financial projections. You're going to need like monthly profit loss and, bal and, you know, updated balance sheet and all that kind of good stuff. You might want somebody internally to help with like, um, in, you know, outgoing and, and you know, re accounts receivable, accounts payable, kind of general bookkeeping. But from a really financial strategy standpoint, you probably want somebody a little higher end and, and they might be a consultant. So Kyle, one of the last questions that I have for you here, say that I'm someone that wants to do something that you have start a SaaS company. I'm sitting here asking you questions about all this stuff. What do you recommend that I do after I stand up out of this chair and go and do right now? What is that? What is that one thing that you recommend I do to start right now? If I don't have anything, I don't have the resources. I haven't found someone that's technical because I'm say not technical in this case. What do you recommend that I do after s stopping listening from this, this recording here, this episode here? What is that one thing that you would tell me to go and do? Go out on LinkedIn and find a hundred people who look like the kind of person that you want to solve a problem for. So let's assume you have an idea, you have a, an idea of a problem you want to try to solve uh, for a specific market. Go out and find a hundred of those people who will talk to you. And if you email a hundred, probably five will have a conversation with you. So it means you probably need to find a thousand people or two thousand people. Try to get like 50 conversations under your belt with that market and really understand their pain. Make sure that they're okay with you following up with them when you have something and try not to pre-sell your solution, but to actually just understand 
what does their day to day look like? What, why is this problem painful and how do they try to solve it currently? And if they had a magic wand, what would they do? Then go, once you understand that, and use some prototyping software. There's, there's Envision, there's Balsamic, I'm sure there's probably more out there. You don't need to be technical and actually just mock up what your ideal solution looks like. Go back to those 50 to 100 people and present your idea and get their feedback. Consolidate it all, put it in a spreadsheet, build a marketing website using a tool like Wix or Squarespace that you don't need to code and start driving some traffic towards it with an email sign up form. Tell them that they will uh, get this when it launches. Um, and then after you kind of have your prototype, have your market validation, go out and have somebody help you build it. Amen. <laughs> That's so true. Like for me, especially, I know that there's people that have problems with building stuff first, building the whole scope of everything out and then not having anyone buy it. But what you just laid out is so perfect because now you have people that want to use it and then you can have those people use it. You can fix it while they're using it, have actual market research and they're using the actual product that you're using or built per se. But there's, I mean, that's, that's in the built, go ahead count. There's two big mistakes that early um, founders make and it's one of them is they they try to hide their idea. I talked to a friend last night who said he had an idea, and, I was, and he was like, "But I don't want to talk tell too many people because they might try to steal." I'm like, get out of that headset right away! Like, nobody's going to steal your idea. Nobody's going to spend the next ten years of their life suffering <laughs> trying to build a business because they heard you talk about your idea. If anything, you need to talk about it more. Talk about it to everyone. Um, and then the other the other big mistake that they make is they just hold themselves back from action. They're like. It just remains an idea, like it did for me. You know, I, I had the idea in 2006. I didn't execute it until, until 2013. So I lost eight years, seven years that I could have been executing because timing wasn't right. I don't really have anyone to build it. I don't know. I'm really busy right now. It's that it's that lack of action that holds people back. So Kyle, before I end it here, when you were talking about your agency, what was that in particular, so that we can clear that up for people listening back to this episode? Was that what um, Proposify was before you actually turned it into a startup, or what was that agency before you had sold it off and started this? It was a it was an agency called Headspace, not the meditation app. But it was it predated the meditation app Headspace. Um, it was a web design and marketing agency. So we had you know some government clients. We built their websites. We did uh, you know marketing campaigns and that kind of thing. And then we we actually started building Proposify within the agency, and then when it was time, we tr we legally transferred the IP over to a new corporation. That was a standalone business. So Kyle, where can we find you? Give us outlets to you, what you're doing, and then we can, we can say goodbye. Yeah, sure, so um, if people wanna check, uh, I guess check out my content, they can go to kyleracky.com. Um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. That's where I spend most of my time and put a lot of uh, content there. Um, and then also the, the company is Proposify.com, P-R-O-P-O-S-I-F-Y.com. Um, and we, we produce a lot of content for a lot of like sales teams and, and um, sales leader kind of content. Awesome. Proposify.com and Kyle Racky with an I. So that's uh, you're not confused there if you go check out his, his bio, with his story. So Kyle, I just want to thank you so much for, for coming out on the show, man. Oh, my pleasure, Josh. Thanks for having me. This episode of Lifetime Value is brought to you by Proposify. Proposify improves sales productivity so your team spends less time creating proposals and more time selling. Start your free trial at Proposify.com and be sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a single episode.